Sensational reports of Florida's invading pythons have made headlines around the world since the 1990s. Growing over six meters or 20 feet in length, Burmese pythons are at the top of the food chain. Non-venomous, they can crush and devour anything that comes their way, from a small rodent to an alligator or human. Whoa. Lately, authorities have noticed a major decline in local wildlife. And when this image of a 76-pound deer inside a python's belly hit the press, it got the public's attention. Threat to humans hit even closer to home when an African rock python killed a 60-pound husky in the Miami suburbs. Could people be next on the menu? The history of the world tells a story of the destruction of native species by those species that we have introduced. One of the most devastating examples of that is happening here in Florida, where Burmese pythons, a formidable predator growing to over 18 feet in length and native to Asia, are eating their way through Florida's native wildlife. So I've traveled to the Everglades to investigate the true scale of this invasion, the Florida python epidemic. The Everglades region is the largest subtropical wilderness in America and covers an area of 730 square miles or 1,900 square kilometers in southern Florida. And for many living near the Everglades, python sightings and encounters are becoming more frequent. While Burmese are the most common, I want to get a look at one of the latest invaders, the very aggressive African rock python. I've come to herpetologist Joe Wozolewski's reptile compound, which is housing a large, recently caught rock python. Joe always tackles this bad boy with some trepidation. Yeah, this is a supercharged uh, python. It's nothing like a Burmese python, as you'll see. Um, how do you tend to do this? When I capture this animal, which is seldom, I like to use the element of surprise. Do you want to actually get it behind the head and actually pull her out properly? Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm going to flip it this way, and we'll just hope for the best. Oh, you got it right. The element of surprise. Good job. There we go. I didn't want to waste any time with this animal because we know what they are like. Yes, right? yeah, yeah. It's a decent sized beast, 11 feet or no. so, and it's powerful. I can certainly yeah. feel its power. Here, let me just kind of. Uh, yeah. There you go. You ready? Your hook. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Boom, straight away. Whoa! It's immediately having a go. Here, I'll hold it. That is, that's a long, that's about two meter strike range. Well, there are thereabouts. And high, coming up at the chest. That is quite something. Just watch how fast that goes. Off it goes. Grab him. Come on. Back you come. All right, you're going to grab him? Because I'm not. Oh, wait, good. Well, I have to put it back in, don't we? <laughs> yes. Right. I'll hold it by the tail. Whoa. It's just. Here, I'll sorry. hold the tail. I got it now. Let's put it back. Okay. Uh, I had it, and then it, then it turned to face me. That's a serious strike range. Okay, now. There you go. All right. All right. Let's just put him back. You ready? Yeah. There we go. Woo! High five. It'll wear you out, won't it? That certainly will. And that has not lost any energy in the last no, little while. No, no, no. Burmese would calm down. That was mm. not calming down. Not it was at still all. Going. So now you see the difference between a Burmese and a rock python. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. Any python this close to human settlement is going to be a problem. And if you're face to face with one in the Miami Dade area, you better call Ruben Ramirez and George Branner, <laughs> the Florida python hunters. This kind of place is just perfect for pythons to hide out in during the day. Well, we got wet for nothing. For the next week, I'll be searching alongside these guys who are licensed by the state to capture pythons and other invasive species, then deliver them to the authorities for euthanizing. They call it herping, and they don't get paid to do it. Herping is the scientific name for like snake hunting, but when you say snake hunting, it sounds like you're hunting, like killing. So you're herping is like catching snakes. The purpose of the Florida Python Hunters was to unite everyone together 
to focus on the same you know, objective, which is to save the ecosystem here in Everglades. If this truly is an invasion, I want to see how many pythons we can catch and measure over the next few days. We begin looking for snakes in the deep hedgerows that line the highways. We're looking for places where the pythons might be resting up and a fence line like this is a great feature because a big python simply won't be able to go through a fence with a mesh that big. So they'll get up against it and then they'll move down and they'll be blocked by it and that's a great place for us to start looking. You have to be a little bit wary of venomous snakes as well, so we're wearing almost knee-high snake boots, which if we do get hit, it's going to have to hit us a very long way up the leg. This is the perfect type of thing we're looking for. See where a big snake or something has been sitting down here. Now we've been checking a load of these little grassy verges and this one is by far the most promising so far. This yeah. one has been full of, of potential python sign. You come across many just by stepping on them. Yeah. You, you tend to yeah. spot. Yeah, you can step on. Whoa, whoa, snake, snake, snake. Where? There. Where? It's a baby. Baby corn snake. Snake number one. <laughs> I just said this is the perfect thing we're looking for. This wasn't entirely what I had in mind. Gorgeous little thing. Native species. Actually really good at keeping down the local rodent populations when they get a little bit larger. Gotta let them go, that's native. It's beautiful. Let the native species go. Down you go. That's a native species, that's the type that we want to be here. It's the invasive pythons, the Burmese pythons, the African rock pythons, and now the carpet pythons from Australia that we're trying to find and trying to take out. Yeah. Uh, this is a good place for them to go crossing the yeah, road as well. They, they cross here. Every night they cross here. Next, a farmer calls in about a python raiding his chickens. And night hunting proves to be a humid, bug-infested hike, where I keep one eye out for venomous snakes and the other for our prey, the invasive Burmese python. Here she comes. Here she comes. I'm working with the Florida python hunters in the Everglades to capture and remove invasive pythons and get an idea of the scale of the epidemic. If we understand the pythons' movements, if we understand what they're eating, if we understand everything we can about their biology, then we have much more of a chance of controlling the invasion. By early 2013, the state of Florida had become so concerned with the growing python population, they held the Python Challenge, a contest with a prize for the greatest number of pythons caught. They came to hunt Burmese pythons in the Everglades, Officials asking ordinary citizens to help find and kill an invasive species that's decimating wildlife. The Pilot Hunt Challenge, there was like 1,600 contestants that came here from all over the U.S. I mean, everybody thought they were going to just be walking and stumbling across them. The biggest problem facing those who want to eradicate the Burmese python is the sheer vastness of the region. More than half of the people who signed up just gave up. It takes a lot more than just coming out here, walking around and seeing a python. You need to really, really know what you're going to focus and look for them and put the time into the field. Reuben and George won the challenge, catching nearly one third of the 68 pythons caught by the 1,600 contestants. This morning, the python hunters got a call from a local farmer who's had a series of disturbing python encounters. Now, this is the gentleman here, the farmer who has been running up against pythons. How are you doing, Monterrey? Thank you. How are you? How are you? Have you found a lot of pythons here? I've killed the big one. The big one? How are you? I'm shooting. Ah, I'm shooting. I'm shooting. I'm shooting. So he's killed three by shooting them from a great distance. Dear, dear. He's had several chickens killed by pythons, and he'd like us to return tonight to see if there are any big snakes coming back for seconds. About 10 days ago, they saw a big one over there, about a 15-footer. The farm is next to a cluttered machine depot, and the combination of tasty animals and plenty of snake hiding spots makes this a python paradise. Inside the cow pasture, there's 
uh, mounds of rocks, stuff where they like to refuge. And then from there, they go into the chicken coops. That's a perfect place though for a nice python to be. Yeah. yeah. It'd be a good way of telling whether there's a python around when all the animals go nuts. There we go. Nice. We can just climb over this one to the side. In terms of animal welfare, this is fantastic because we've got a really nice free-range area for the chickens. They can just come and go as they please. And for the pythons, this is just, well, it's just a beacon. This makes just a perfect environment for the pythons. I mean, they can just come in here, feed at night, and then out they go back into their burrows out all around these fields and these areas. Pythons have returned here night after night, and we know they could be lurking anywhere. That's where he found the python. He came, the landowner came. The python was coiled up right in this corner right here with the chicken in it. Climb back out of this one. No snakes here tonight. But across Florida, pythons find the smell of caged birds irresistible. Chicken coops lure pythons in bringing them into close contact with bigger farm animals, pets, and humans. The big snake's hunting instinct takes over, and there's no stopping him. Back at the farm, I find another kind of invasive predator originally brought over to control insects in sugarcane fields. Just come across what is one of the most infamous invasive species anywhere in the world. It's a cane toad. They're an absolute disaster for two main reasons. Firstly, they're voracious predators themselves. They eat eggs, they eat anything they can get their teeth on, basically. And secondly, they're highly toxic. These glands on the back of its head exude a nasty toxin, which is fatal to most species that ingest it. So they have no natural predators. There's almost no way of actually killing them in the wild. These guys are hell on earth. With no snakes at the farm, we head out to an Everglades highway, a python hotbed. The daytime temperatures here in Florida, even at this time of year, in the fall, the autumn, still exceedingly high and the pythons just lie up in the shade or down a hole somewhere hidden and it's at night time when they come out to go hunt. We're heading off now to find an area of road where they cross between two parts of the Everglades National Park which are apparently infested with pythons. The biggest biggest snake you get around here would be a rattlesnake, naturally. Yeah. So totally naive population. Nothing of of, nothing native here knows what a python is. Since getting out of the truck, I've seen two rats already. This place is just full of food. Catching a python here is not easy. We're looking for just a tail sticking out. If we make a wrong move, the snake has an easy escape into the canal. Where we're walking now is perfect hunting ground for the pythons. Exactly, so they come up to the, this ridge here and they do their hunt and then from here they just go back into the water, back into, see this Everglades sawgrass? Yeah. I mean, that's where they go back into. Then we spot something. You can see it right there. Yeah, she's bigger than six feet. This is a decent sized animal. Here she comes. Here she comes. Look at that. Fantastic, big Burmese python. We can snap at the shoes. Wow, beautiful nice beast. Guy. Look at the size of her. Seven feet or so, almost. Yeah. First night, not bad going. There we go. Oh, she's just got some little bits of soil. What a beautiful, beautiful beast. That is spectacular. As you and I were talking about it's a really bittersweet moment, isn't it, this? It is a bittersweet moment. Unfortunately, it has to get 
put down, euthanized. Now, the disaster is, in many cases, species that are invasive in one place are actually rare in their homeland. Exactly. And the Burmese python is a threatened species in back Asia. in Asia. Yeah, yeah, so Unfortunately, I... just <laughs> disastrous for the native species here in the United States. Okay, right now what I got to do on this python here is get the exact time, date, uh, and uh, longitude and latitude where it was captured. Uh, from there Snakes are measured and GPS coordinates are taken for the official records. Mm -hmm. West 80.765. 80. So where does the information that you collect get sent? Okay, I got to report it to uh, FWC. So give them Florida all the data. Wildlife Commission. Yes, for their studies and uh, do their uh, stomach content and see how they're affecting the ecosystem. Well, she's shy two inches or seven feet. Sadly, these snakes will be euthanized at a local university. What's the protocol? The protocol for this now, for the transport of the python, has got to be double bagged. It's got to put in a, in a container uh, with uh, double locks. And it's got to be the box, it's got to be labeled uh, dangerous reptiles. Here we are, here we are, here we are. No sooner do we have one in the bag when I come across a second python. That's a nice I can one. See, right it's, there. A it's a male as well. The last one was a female. There we go. Measurements are taken on this eight foot specimen, then it's bagged for the night. Two Burmese pythons caught just minutes apart. This is an invasion. Next, I hit the Everglades to scout the levees for big snakes hunting mammals. And we get a 911 call from a farmer who needs us to capture a python. Just in, just in case. I'm in Florida's Everglades, looking into the invasive python epidemic now spilling out into surrounding farms and suburbs. It's dawn, and we had our first python capture yesterday, which was, which was great. And it was a decent size, it's just under seven feet, which by any normal snake standards is an enormous snake. But obviously by the standards of your big constrictors, that's not huge. What we're seeing here is that there's a large number of two, three, four, five year old pythons in the six to 10 feet range. And that's probably because after the major cold spell, 2010, which killed off a lot of the pythons, these are the only ones that are now coming back. So those that survived, gave birth, and it's their progeny that we're now seeing. But are there still monster-sized snakes out there? I'm heading out with Bob, a local guide into the heart of the Everglades, to see where some of these bigger snakes may still be thriving. Well, we've just been scouting around the Everglades looking for a spot where the pythons might possibly be residing. And basically, it's all marsh, it's all swamp, but there are a few levees which have been built to rise up above the swamps. They provide a bit of a refuge of dry land. With the area scouted out, my plan is to return here late tonight, when things cool down and the pythons come out to hunt. Back at base camp, Airboat guide Bob Freer shows me a python specimen he collected a few years ago. According to the media, the biggest python ever caught in the Florida Everglades was 18 feet and 7 inches long. According to Bob Freer, the biggest python was 23 feet long, caught in the early 90s. And on the evidence of this, I think Bob was right. It's just after sunset, and I'm heading back to the levee to search for signs of small mammals and pythons. We've got this mile stretch of levee, so if the snakes are taking refuge anywhere, it's likely to be up here. I think we need to spread out as much as we possibly yeah. can. We're going to have George walk down this side here. Because they could be coming out of the canals there. Out or of out the, the canal the or out of that side coming up here, yeah. How far is it down the levee? About a mile. Great, OK, so we'll be able to thoroughly, thoroughly search that. Brilliant. Up the road, up the road. We're coming up the road, what do you got? 
tell him it's just a corn snake. <laughs> oh, yeah, fantastic. Well, I've smelled snake twice so far. A really distinctive smell, both occasions. And one of them, I found, found a little corn snake, similar to the other one I found, just a tiny little thing. So I guess that was what was giving off the smell, but maybe not. Maybe a python had been there and had had a tussle and had killed something. When I was a kid, I used to come out here. I mean, there was corn snakes all over the place. You see how it is now? No, you don't see. There's nothing. I mean, you got. We haven't seen any kind of mammals. No rats. No raccoons. No possums. We haven't seen anything. So you think the pythons are now moving out into suburbia more and into the agricultural lands more because that's where the food is? Yeah, they've got agriculture. They got, they got that's where the rats go to eat. We take a last look around for pythons at the end of the levee. This stretch of water is known to have alligators in it. We watch our step. When I was a schoolboy in Australia, one of my brother's classmates got grabbed on the side of her head by a carpet python which had lent off the garage. So pythons definitely do see people as viable food. Then Reuben spots something. I got something crawling on my head. It's a praying mantis. Excellent. You see? Yeah, look at that. <laughs> there is life here, after all. Who said the Everglades were empty of wildlife? Look at this. <laughs> Fantastic. I love mantises, they're really cool. Where are you? Where are you? There you are. Come on. Come on. Fantastic, look at that. So one of the most interesting things about mantises is they if you go back through the fossil record, they evolved flight, they lost it, they evolved really? it again. It's really, really crazy. I love how they bob. The only other thing that does that really frequently is like a, an eagle, the way eagles do that. Yeah. Hopefully they check stuff out, the mantis is doing the same. That's amazing. There you go, little guy. It's surprising to find such little life in these rich wetlands. Unbelievably, Studies by the state confirm the pythons have reduced some small mammal populations by 99% in southern Florida. On our way back, an unexpected stop. Our airboat smashes into solid ground, launching us into a canal. Take some muscle to get it off the bank. We're clear. Back on dry land, the python hunt continues. When Reuben gets an unexpected call. I think I got something for you. I got a little snake for you here, man. What what was the coloration of it? I think it's a uh, it's a python. All right, we're on our way. Now? Yeah. Yeah, we're on our way right now. I love the fact that the guys are on a speed dial to go and respond to any snake emergencies in the area. It's great that people are doing that as opposed to just killing anything they see there. Calling up the experts and asking the experts to deal with it. It's a good step in the right direction. So you've got the snake in a bucket? Yeah, I saw the snake under the uh, golf cart and she moved over and coiled up and I put a bucket on top of it. And that's when I called you guys. My son is uh, anxious, uh, awaiting. <laughs> Have you seen the snake yet? No, he hasn't. You seen haven't it seen yet. it. You no, looking no, forward no, to no. seeing it? Okay. I've got a snake hook on me if we need it. Okay. Yeah, I got a hook. Just, just in case. That is a python. You yeah. never know what you're going to get on one of these calls. It's good to be prepared for any size reptile. Gotta watch out with that one. Huh? Yeah. So it's probably about five or six feet long, actually. It's a perfect example. We've got a snake coming into a farm area because you've got a lot of frogs, as you were saying. Yep. Presumably a lot of rodents may be attracted to this area too. It's not in great shape. It's, it's okay, but it's not, it's, not, it's not full. And I think that's been a bit of a trend of the ones that, that we've been seeing. They haven't been really, really well fed. There's probably so many snakes out there that they're starting to eat themselves out of the natural habitat. Yeah, and exactly. they're now being forced onto people's territory to find find food. We're not seeing many mammals, are we? We're not seeing, oh, yes. not seeing many rats or mice or the types of things that 
used to be really abundant here, seem to be declining. Do you want to come and touch it? Do you want to touch it? Yeah, you should. You sure? Because I've, I've got the head, so it's totally safe. And then really, really nice and smooth. Really soft. It's okay, I'll just touch the, touch the head, just, just by my thumb. There we go. Look at that. Oh, you saw the tongue come off. So it uses that to taste and then figure out where its food is and what's around. They, they taste the air. I want people to know these pythons are not evil, but are adapting as best they can to the new environment they've been thrown into. The work Ruben and his team are doing is vital, not just removing a threat, but also improving the reptile's image. See that? <laughs> How does that feel? So you guys have got all the information you need. You can yeah. take it right now. One happy customer and an invasive python in the bag. We're off on another investigation when a python shows up in the least likely place. I'm nearing the end of my fifth day in Florida, now scanning along the canals bordering the highways. When I get an unexpected python encounter at a service station. Here it is. So it's 10 past 11 at night. These guys spotted the Florida Python Hunters logo emblazoned on the back of their truck. So in here, Burmese Python. Like, so how, how did you come across this? Were you looking for it or? No, we were coming down a dirt road and it was laid right in the middle of the road. And uh, we just reached out and grabbed it and threw it in the cooler and trying to figure out what we're going to do with it. Have you decided what to do with it yet? Yeah, y'all are taking it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to get it back out again, and then, yeah, then, then, then we'll, we'll measure it? Whoop, I was going right. to say it's really nice and calm, and then it suddenly went mental. <laughs> so, it's yeah, it's big. Right. So, here on the floor of the gas station, let's measure it up. Got that in. There we go. Two inches shy of eight. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was big when Seven I saw it. Seven feet ten. Seven feet ten inches. That's a decent size. When we go out hunting in the big cypress, we haven't been seeing any any type of rodents lately. And you used to see a lot more of those. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's getting very bad out there. The decline in mammals has really coincided with the rise in, yeah. in python numbers. Even more evidence of the big snake seriously impacting the mammal population. I'm done for the night, but have arranged to meet another man who actually quit his job to hunt invasive species every day. I'm visiting a friend of Ruben's who's made a full-time job of catching feisty Argentinian lizards, the tegus. Measuring up to four and a half feet, or 1.4 meters, tegus are gobbling up the eggs of Florida's birds and reptiles, like the endangered American crocodile. How does a man get into tegu catching? I'm a private yacht captain. I do demolition work, and I busted up my shoulder in such a way that uh, I couldn't do those uh, activities anymore. And I looked into the tegu problem here in South Florida and said, well, I can catch tegus. It's just a matter of, uh, it's kind of a learning process. I'm seven days a week finding tegus. It's turned into a 70, 80 hour a week job. As we go this way, the, uh, the size gets smaller. It's not just checking the traps, it's building the traps, building the enclosures, feeding 280 tegus of different sizes. Rodney gives me a tour of his tegu operation. He's selling these invasive reptiles to clients in Asia, both as food and as pets. Ah, you little prick, you got me. Now in the morning, you know, they're a little slower, but this time of day, they'll be laying around like, like that and because of the temperatures, they're ready to go right now. Just touch them and they're spring-loaded. God, oh, really has taken a chunk out of you. That was a quick bite. He bit and released. Sometimes, that big one that got me on the arm, he bit and hang, hung on like an alligator. And every time I'd move, he would go for a better grip like an alligator does. <clears throat> I've got one hand here holding him and he's clumped onto the other arm. I'm thinking, how am I gonna get him off? But, it's the back feet. Oh wow, it's able to bend yeah, right around. I'm talking about. So it's trying to bend all yeah, the way See, alligator can't do that. Yeah. And they are just incredibly quick. Feeding on the young of other animals, um, most of the time they won't even see the tegu coming. It, it'll happen so fast. And they've got sharp claws on the back Very feet as well. Sharp claws. Front are smaller, but these ones are big okay. on the back. Here we go. I'm going to hand them to you. This, this grip here, and yeah. then at the base of the tail. Anything goes south, just let go. 
and down here. Okay, and just apply pressure if it starts getting squirrely. This is kind of a different story. There was a, a large breeding operation, breeding tegus for the pet trade. And about 12 years ago, he released his animals into the wild. On purpose? On purpose. When that occurred, uh, they had the absolute best habitat that you could ever imagine for a tegu. And they've discovered that, yeah, they can do real well here. This is basically uh, continue what they were doing originally in, in Argentina. So we're checking all of Rodney's tegu traps. This is trap number one. Yep, traps down. That's always a good sign. Oh, let's check us out. Get him up. I think uh, I could probably bare hand this little guy. See, they can reach around incredibly far. It's not so bad with a little one, but when you get a big one, it reaches that far back. Okay. Reset the trap. Yep. Multitasking. Okay, trap is reset. We're going to be turning around, heading back that way, check the next trap. Oh, yeah. Oh, the yeah. size of that. This one's all yours. Yeah. I'd suggest two gloves on this guy. It's a really big one. Two gloves. I'd suggest just pull the whole trap up. So is it that way? Yep. And you can be ready because he's going to try to spin. Look at that. It's a head forward. All right, you got it. Just hang on to the head. Good grip. Go, I got At this point, you own him. Now he's going to try to spin. Okay, let's grab him. That is a strong animal. Yes, they are. Now he can't spin. A bit different from a crocodilian. Okay, that let me open the trunk. Seriously we'll just... strong. I feel that Rodney's doing an amazing service here. It's not just a commercial venture, although that's obviously a positive aside, but this is one of the most devastating invasive species we have here in America. And to be removing them at the rate that Rodney's removing them is doing wonders for the wildlife of the Everglades and hopefully will go some way to preventing the extinction of critical and iconic species such as the American crocodile. Let's bag him up. It's getting screwed in here. There we go, I got him now. Okay. Good to go. Done. Nice work. Despite Rodney and Ruben's efforts, Tegu numbers, like Python numbers, just keep rising. Tomorrow, I'll follow up on some stories of a giant python eating livestock near a restaurant and pursue tales of snakes and escaped monkeys on a very mysterious island. Look at that. Fantastic big Burmese python. Working alongside the Florida python hunters, I'm now searching for the invasive snakes next to irrigated fields. This kind of time in the morning is the perfect time to find any snakes that are wanting to warm up. I'm going to be coming to the east bank to catch some morning sun. This is the best place to look. As the sun warms things up, start walking from here. Pythons crawl into the coolest places they can find to maintain their body temperature. I see pythons here all the time uh, when they're passing the you know the grader yeah. to the to the fields. It's like a little island. It's like a little refuge. Yeah. So whatever gets scared, spooked, there's a good possibility that there could be one in there. So if we do, we do this ridge and then head on over the, to that yeah, that's island. That's what I would I would do. Yeah. Now let's check up under these rocks right here. Let's see if there's anything. Here. Now it's so hot. The only place they're going to be is somewhere in the shade. Nothing yet. Uh, let's check. Oh, massive ant's nest. What's your hands? No, nothing. No sign of pythons near these fields today. Apparently, during Hurricane Andrew, 
medical research facility was also demolished by the storm. And that pocket of forest over there is now populated by the monkeys that used to be in that research facility. So it's an absolute mess. <laughs> Where you find infected lab monkeys, there might be pythons. I can't wait to get over to that ominous looking island of trees. Here, we're hoping to find the kind of big snakes described by field workers. Now, we have the added possibility of finding diseased monkeys said to inhabit this miniature jungle. Check some of the greener areas. It's midday, it's already, been, it's, it's already hot. The pythons now are going into this thick vegetation where it's nice and cool, like uh, hide up under you know, the root systems where it's nice and cool. As we've seen, they can just disappear into absolute nothingness. They're amazing masters of stealth. Our senses are on full alert as we penetrate this dense habitat. Could a big python be in here? You've got a really, really freshly shed skin. You can tell it's fresh because it's still really soft, pliable, and even almost feels moist in places. You've got all the way from the head, pretty much the most perfect shed I've ever seen. It's got all of the scales on the mouth and head. It's even got the eyes. It's the eyes, everything is intact. And it was crawling up this up way. that way, and then it will have headed on. We do know a good sized python is in this jungle, but he could be up in the trees or slipped into any of the large crevices beneath our feet. As for the monkeys, well, we did find some suspicious monkey scat. It could be wild pig, but possibly belongs to a primate. I'd expect monkey to be slightly more liquid. Find a bit of fruit skin, but could be. Um, mystery scat. Next, Ruben gets a call from another Python Hunter team member, Jason, about recent sightings at a restaurant. You've heard the rumours about a very big python living here, either underneath the restaurant or somewhere around this lake. And coming in and eating the ducks and eating the goats. A month ago, uh, a waitress that works here spotted a python going towards actually this building here, but there hasn't been any uh, actual like photographs or any actual proof that it has been coming here and eating and then going back under this, this building here itself. But we know that there are massive snakes very nearby. So a few months ago, Jason caught the largest snake that's been officially recorded in, well, in Florida. State of Florida, correct. In the state of Florida, just about a mile that way. Correct. Jason leads the way to the location where he went one on one with a huge python. Have you ever seen any other snakes, or that only this time? That was the only time I've seen a snake here. Look at this. So when you saw the snake and you approached it, what happened then? First thing I did, open his mouth, it just grabbed him by the neck. Had to pull him out this way, he wasn't coming out. And so I basically just sat on him. Yeah, he's fucking getting loose. He started wrapping around me within less than a minute, and had two or three wraps around me. He's gonna try fucking the thing I was definitely scared of, him biting me the most, just because I already knew if he got onto me, I'm gonna need stitches, I'm going to the hospital, bad infection. Amazing stuff, amazing story. Yeah, cheers, man. Thank you. Clearly, despite the big freeze of 2010, huge snakes are still out there. Next, I enter a post-apocalyptic scene, come up with Python Gold. Python is great. I'm on the final leg of my investigation into Florida's pythons. That's a python. Yeah, yeah. And so far, impressed by the sheer numbers of them in a wide range of locations here in Florida. But the mystery of just how they got here remains. Tonight, Ruben suggested a largely abandoned cement factory. We've come to another location to look for pythons, this one. 
post-apocalyptic setting. There's our factory behind us with all the cooling towers. We're on a dirt road. We're heading into the beautiful full moon. That python in the road? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I see. Excellent. Just amazing to see it on, on the road like that. Come on, little thing, you twisted yourself. And this is what they do. They have this amazing ability to wrap themselves up in knots and then try and pull their head through the knot they're making. But it's doing a good job of tying itself up. And I always try and control the head because that's the bit with the sharp parts. <laughs> it's actually co coiled itself somehow through the button in my shirt. Do you mind just undoing that button? <laughs> They always look for leverage, and the tail is what provides it. There we go. So I'll just unwind it. And they've got such immense power, because it's just a column of muscle all the way down. They've got incredible strength. I'll try and process this now as quickly as we can, just to minimise the stress to it. It's five feet, seven inches. In it goes. Right. But this is crazy. We literally just put the other one in the bag and George had gone off for a walk just to spot other snakes and he's called us this second. Ooh, it's, it's coiled, it knows we're here. It's ready to strike. <laughs> That's a bit of a fight. This one was ready. Fantastic work, George. <laughs> Two minutes after putting the other one in the bag and George came through on the radio. Oh, it's now it's clicking the buttons on my watch. And Feisty, it was ready to go. Yeah, that one would have got. It almost yeah, this, is. this one would have got me. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> this place is obviously seriously, seriously good for snakes. Yeah, all around here, there's, there's all, all right. kind of. Yeah, it really is having a go. Oh, there you go. Dear, dear. And we'll have to tire it out a little bit more before it's easy to measure. Too slow, man. Yeah. Mm. Five feet nine inches. Five feet nine. Yeah. Number one's gonna get bit here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is a seriously, seriously feisty animal. Well Did done. it. Yeah, well done. I'm back at Joe's snake compound searching for answers about the origin of the python invasion. And unlike most press reports, there's a bigger story here than just escaped pets. My theory is kind of a combination of everybody else's theory. People do buy small pythons as pets, and they get big, they get old, people, they don't want the snake anymore. The zoos won't take it, so people release them. So the other part of my theory is uh, there was an importer in an area very near Everglades National Park, and in 92, Hurricane Andrew blew through South Florida, and it went right through that importer who happened to have 900 Burmese pythons, and they were blown straight into the Everglades. And if you think about it, let's say 50 females survived, and in three years they're mature, they can breed. Let's just even say 10 hatchlings. Bottom end. So that's 500 the first three years. And then if you look every three years, there will be a spike, a logarithmic spike. It would actually be quite easy to trace the origin of that first outburst it, using genetics. You could see whether it did indeed come from that importer. Or yes, whether. the animals that are being captured now are, are traced back to the importer. When I came to the Florida Everglades, I expected to find pythons. But what I was shocked to find was that the Everglades, world famous for their abundance of wildlife, seem almost empty. All of the mammals that should be here appear to have vanished. And because of that, the pythons, whose numbers are still exploding, are now leaving the swamps and entering suburbia. The introduction of pythons to Florida, as with the introduction of any invasive species, from cane toads to feral hogs, was an ecological disaster of our own making. But it's only now that the pythons are coming onto our farms and into our homes and growing to the types of sizes where attacks on household pets and on people are a very real possibility. That the local people here are only beginning to understand the scale of the problem. In other words, once again, we have messed with nature. And once again, nature is biting back.